much. Okay, I, I'm Jill Gibson, and I want you all to humor me. Everybody stand up, please, stand up. March in place, articulate the ankles, roll the shoulders, because I want blood to the brain. Because this is going to be a discussion presentation. Don't go ahead after you've like got the blood moving. Now you all can sit down. But sometimes you just got to stand up. I don't know about you, but I do. Oh, anyway, so as Pat was saying, my name is Jill Gibson. I'm the owner of SoftTech Solutions. We've been around for over 11 years. As far as a little bit about my background, um, <clears throat> where do I start? I'll stop at 25 years ago when I got into data and analysis and design. I've been doing it longer than that, but that's where I'm going to stop. Um, I do remember the black screen with the green text. I do remember when we could attach a document and an email. Um, it's been a wild ride for a very long time. The reason that this, this topic is very interesting to me is because it's all about efficiencies. It's all about building a better mousetrap. It's all about questioning how you do business and are you doing it to the best of your ability and the most efficiently. So first thing I want to do is let's take a look at this picture. Now everybody wants this kind of mob of this much business coming through your door, right? Isn't that we all, that's why we work for, every, work for ourselves versus working for somebody else. Um, I find that funny because it, be careful what you wish for. I've had multiple customers actually uh, call me up going, what the heck am I going to do? There was no scalability in their processes. There was no efficiency in the systems that they had in place. They started with a great concept, but unfortunately, they didn't know how to grow or handle and manage this type of behavior, this type of excitement about their concept. Anybody feel that a little bit of a groundswell right now with their business? They've started something, they're starting to see some interest, they've got some traction going. Are you getting a little bit overwhelmed? Am I following up with everybody? Is everybody getting what they need from my company, my consultants, the services that I offer? Are you thinking about that? Are you putting yourself in their shoes? So here's my question. What do you think potentially could be, I call them business thieves, things that are in your company right now that could be costing you money, the ultimate profit? This is why I want you to stand up. I want you to think about what it is that possibly could be robbing your profits or things in your company. Any ideas? Just a little bit about what I was talking about earlier. I kind of was giving you some lead-ins to some of those answers. What possibly could be going on right now in your business? Maybe the computer using. Equipment. It could be antiquated. It might not be applications that are proper for what you're doing. That's a fantastic one. My favorite, my first one, is time. That is the biggest thief I've ever seen in any company. I don't care if you're a sole proprietor or a Fortune 500 company. <clears throat> what could be time wasters in your company or your business? Your computers. I'm loving this. Software. It's true. Antiquated software, older computers, you're waiting. You click on something, go get a cup of coffee, come back, it finally displays. That's true. Very good, very good point. What about, like I was saying earlier, scalability? You start with a concept on how to manage your prospects to your customers. Are you questioning that process? Are you moving fast enough? Are you automating anything? Are you reviewing how it, you can get that information to your customer that service faster? Because it's all about the loyalty and the, the satisfaction of what your, your customers are getting from you. Another one, lack of defined processes. I cannot tell you how many times myself and or my consultants uh, that work for me go into companies and I'm, I'm talking large, large companies that I do not see defined processes. I don't see an onboarding for new employees. They say, well, we just have a new employee come in and they shadow somebody for three days and they sit right next to them. And I said, okay, so that person they're shadowing, are they doing everything right? Are they doing the processes the way you expected them to do maybe a year ago? Have you updated the processes? Are they following them? Is it written down? How can you ensure that they're doing things the way you need them to be done? And again, another big one, business goals and measurements. I'm, you know, I heard cash is king. Well, then that's fine. Data is queen. Because 
information in your business is gold. It is truly gold. And if you're not paying attention to setting up goals or any type of measurement on how you're doing, how do you know that you're being successful and you're moving in the right direction? So if you're not reviewing anything that you're storing or tracking or watching, how would you know that you're doing the right things? So number one, tend to customer needs. Now, I'm going to throw something at you. Where are you with your prospects' needs? Ever think about this? How are you closing that deal faster or better with a potential prospect? Because they're not a customer yet, but you're trying to close that. How are you, how are you doing that as efficiently and as professionally as possible so that they wouldn't want to go anywhere else but to do business with your company? <coughs> think about your processes. Questions about that, because I've got some examples and I want to make sure that we talk about this, because I'm always building my own better mouse trap. I'm always designing something new and better and different in my company to be even more efficient, uh, to get that customer to, like I said, don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, just a case in point, SoftTech Solutions has been around now for th 11 years, and I did a report recently, and I mentioned this to Pat, but the numbers actually got up a little bit higher. I like to see uh, retention and attrition rates with my customers, my clients. How long have they been staying? How long did they, how long did they stay before they left, if they've left, etc. I was really stunned. I just ran this report two years ago, uh, two, two weeks ago, and from two years ago it went up quite a bit. But the average customer that stays with SoftTech Solutions is now at 8.9 years. We've been in business for 11. Now, if you think about that, that means they feel comfortable with what we're doing. We're helping with their efficiencies. We're saving them money. We're also helping them understand how to make more money with the data that they are now storing and reviewing. And again, people are like, oh, this is so esoteric. But it really isn't. It's critical to any business. I mean, you may, not, you may need equipment leasing. You might need a self-directed IRA. You might look at investments or financing. But this piece is critical to every single business. If you don't understand how your company is structured or how you do business by the data you're storing or your processes that you've defined, that's a, that's a real uh, potential uh, pitfall or a pain point. Uh, as far as an example, like I said, I like to always build a better mousetrap. This just happened recently, and I was sharing this to Pat. Even myself, thinking my brain just always absorbs as much data as possible, and I've got a great memory, thank goodness. But I started a new process that when a prospect, case in point, prospect calls up, and I have an application that creates a quote that automatically updates my contact management system, my CRM, so that it's called an opportunity, and I can see all of my open quotes, and I can see the expiration dates, and I can stay on top of it, there's a, things that automatically add to my calendar, so I make sure there's a phone call or an email. But <laughs> the reason I'm smiling is because I didn't always have, until recently, a follow-up of receipt, of a quote receipt. And I, I just started that about a month ago. A quote receipt within 48 hours that I would call up and say, did you get the quote I emailed you? based on our conversation or our meeting, and this is, these are the services or the, the software you're looking for to purchase from us. That one serves two things. Two, uh, one, it serves that I know them, they, they've received it, they like the follow-up, they're like really impressed that I call within two days to go, do you have any questions? When would you like to talk about the actual details? This was the initial draft of the quote. What did I possibly miss or what do we have to go further into? Again, you start building that partnership with that prospect, they're going to think, where or why do I want to go with anybody else? Because that person is making me feel of value. I'm important. Uh, when I put that reminder in there, I found out, again, data is, like I said, key or queen. Um, my overall closure rate, successful close rate of quotes went up by 25%. I was stunned. And you would think that's such a no-brainer. Of course you'd want to follow up with that. But with all the emails and electronics, you're thinking, oh, of course it was received, and they will call me back. Follow up. Follow up on that quote. It's kind of a, a rudimentary thing, but it was an eye-opener for me also. As far as other examples, I mean, there's just so many. When it comes to data, and again, processes, prospects, 
you want to make sure that you're paying attention to these things. I've already talked about customer retention. Can you right now give me a figure of what percentage, where are you with your customer retention? From initial inception of they become a customer to are they still a customer, when did they jump, the time length, can you wrap your head around what is your retention rate with your customers? Because here's a question for everybody and I really would like an answer. What's more important, keeping the customers you have or focusing on gaining new ones? And why is that? Why keeping the ones you have? Word of mouth. I'm loving her. You think I'm paying her or something. She's right. It's word of mouth. Because again, I do a lot of public speaking, but I do not spend money on print ads. I do not spend money. I take that back. I just finally went to an experiment on online pay-per-clicks and landing pages. We just have rolled this out over the last month. And my poor web designer marketing company, they have no idea who they're dealing with because I'm always asking for, what do you think? Data. I want to know, where are we? What's the open rate? What's the click rate? I spent this much money. What is the cost? How much do I now have to get as a deal to offset what I've been paying you? And it's interesting because now they're scrambling. They're learning to make, make better reporting for all the other customers they have because I keep challenging them. Because I want to make sure that if I'm spending money, it better be coming back at least two times the amount I'm putting in. Um, so like I said, the referrals are huge. Another thing, another uh, article that I, I just recently read, well recently, about six months ago, but I think it's true. When you have uh, low maintenance, high profit clients, you've got that relationship, you've got that partnership, they trust you, you trust them. It's almost like a friendship. I've got a lot of customers that I, I'm invited to their uh, kids' weddings or you know, family affairs, whatever. If I'm in the area, they want to say stop by, go to a barbecue. I think it's very nice of them. Um, but what I find interesting is the article I was talking about was that <clears throat> the article was, I just, I, just one second, because I have two thoughts coming together and they're colliding in my brain. Um, the, the article was talking about the fact that when you have that relationship and when you have that trust uh, and you've got that low maintenance, high profit client, I mean, you really like this person, they like you, they know like people of like, uh, that are like themselves. They're people that are on time, they're on topic, they're, they're, on, they're, they're professionally uh, doing very well. It's pretty rare that I meet someone that really has their act together and then they meet somebody that completely doesn't. Because usually business owners hang out with the same type of people. Uh, I found that a fascinating article. And I've been kind of mentally testing it when I'm thinking about where my referrals come from. And um, so the, refer, the referral person, the referee that I've just come in. And so far the article's holding true. The ones that I hate to say are, are a hot mess. The clients that make me crazy, that I want to fire. And I've actually fired a couple in 11 years. I have. I've given them other referral names because this is not a good relationship. It's like, time to get a divorce. We can't do this anymore. You're killing me. So this is actually a two-point discussion of this question. Obviously, maintain the ones. If you've got good processes and you've got good data and you know how to handle and manage your customers' needs, keeping your customers is not that much work. Because it's such a low process, because it's so easy to do, Gaining new ones just kind of come in through the back door. They just come to you. I am really not out there trolling for a whole bunch of new clients, yet I have 22% growth year after year in 11 years as far as customers and retention. As I was saying earlier, process. Do any of you have a process map or do you ever have any of your processes defined or even written down? Like if you get a phone call from a prospect, then what? Do you email them? Do you drop in uh, some piece of marketing into the mail? Do you schedule a meeting? Then after that step, then what? After the meeting, do you send a thank you note? Do you make another phone call? Is, there, is that usually when a quote is requested? I would really recommend starting to lay this out. It sounds so tedious, I know. But myself and my consultants are hired to do this also. We've actually done beautiful uh, Visio uh, process designs and also with uh, actual uh, uh, verbal uh, process maps so that not only do you have someone that's a visual learner, they also can read in more detail what each of those steps entails or is needed to do. 
Because if you think about it, what does a process map do? It helps standardize how you do business. Imagine, like I was saying earlier, that company, and there's so many that do this because I think it's so efficient, but it really is not. Oh, well, this person's just going to shadow this person for a week. Or I heard two days once. Well, they've got two days. They got this. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? How can, how can they understand everything that their job is entailing? And also, how do you maintain or manage the quality of how your, how your company is managing your customers? Here's a great example, and I've told this story before in other presentations, but I absolutely just, I lived this and I love it. Um, it's the um, holiday dinner story. So a little girl was talking to her mom in the kitchen, and mom was preparing a ham. And she saw her mother cut the ends off the ham, and the little girl said, well, why would you do that? And all of a sudden the mother stood up and said, you know what, I have no idea, my mom always did this. So the little girl said, so the mom says, why don't you go and ask grandma? Grandma was sitting at the table in the dining room. The little girl went into the dining room. Grandma, mom asked me to ask you, why is it that we cut the, ha the ends off the ham? And the grandmother said, you know what? I have never thought to ask that. That is very interesting. You need to go talk to great grandma. She's in the rocker in the, in the uh, family room. So the little girl's now getting a little annoyed because it's like, why don't you all have an answer? So the little girl finally goes into the family room and there's grandma rocking, great grandma rocking in the chair little girl says, nobody seems to understand this, but I really want to know why. Why do we cut the ends off the ham? And great grandma said, the oven was too small. <laughs> well, I heard was that it didn't fit in the pan. Yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah. I yeah. like the oven, because the whole equipment, your question about that. But that's just it is, do you think over how many generations maybe the oven size got bigger? And so within companies, if you don't write down processes and have it defined, because if you have a yearly review of your processes, that's when you question, is this still effective? Are we still meeting the needs of our customers? Is this the best way we should be doing it? Because it's written, then you can challenge versus basing, this off, basing it off of memory or interpretation. Because it's the other thing that I've noticed is when I've come into companies, and I just love this, is management will say, you need to do it X, Y, and Z. Well, they're not really in the trenches, and so the people working at the company, they'll do like A, E, F, G, and Q, but X, Y, and Z don't really apply. And you should hear the internal buzz from the employees. And it's almost like an under or groundswell of, I, I don't know, subordination, whatever you want, because the employees sometimes don't understand why X, Y, and Z are important, because that's usually reporting or it's you know, projection goals that really don't pertain to them. So that's why they do what they think is effective. But usually when I see this type of, I'll call it subconscious uh, insubordination, it's because nothing's been really written down so that nobody can actually say, this is the quality of how we have to do it. And you have to do it this way. Or the employees can't go, I'm challenging this because X, Y, and Z are antiquated. We now have this new equipment and this new software and this makes life a lot easier. We should change this. It actually works both ways. So. Where are you storing your data? All right, right now, where are you storing your data when it comes to your customers? And if you say post-it notes, that's fine. <laughs> Anything else? I've heard it. I've seen actually a monitor screen bordered with yellow post-its, and that was their follow-up system. I have actually, I should have taken a picture. What, how else do you follow up, or how do you maintain what your clients need right now? What, what systems do you use? Go ahead. She's brave. <laughs> I love computers to death. I've been in the industry since 1981. But when you need to get to a client and you want to get them fast, I find a plain old little notebook. And it's okay. It has worked the best for me. Mm -hmm. My client writes their name on that, they write their phone number, and they tell me what it is that they like. And I know I have that. I that book and I give them a call instead of trying to wait to get on the system, get in the system, get the information, and I've got somebody else coming up. So I'm sorry, sometimes old fashioned works just as well as you can. You know what? And I am so not going to say you're wrong. It all how you want to do business. Absolutely. I agree. Anything else? I know I know you have to be keeping it somewhere. So how are you keeping your data right now on your customers' needs? What are you doing besides a notebook? Which is not wrong. Yeah. CRM, HRM, uh, using groupwares, things like that. 
Okay, so more like online. So you're talking about databases and you um, well, through our company, we have our own internal servers. Okay, that's great. Now, do you have automated reminders? Do you have follow-ups? Do you have? Is it integrated all with your Outlook? It's all integrated through uh, SaaS type softwares and uh, okay. using open source. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Now, for the rest of you that doesn't have this fantastic option available, what else or how else are you storing your clients' information or how you're following up? Yeah. I have, I have a retail shop, so I'm a little bit not familiar with the thinking of how all of this fits into my model, but we do have, um, we have Acupaz as our point of sale system, <coughs> okay. and Sage as our accounting system, and yep. we collect customer data in our royalty program that's inherent in Acupaz, and it doesn't have any bells and whistles like follow-ups and reminders. Okay. Even a way to capture much information about what they sell I don't want to pick on you, but my question, have you ever thought about, well, how can I find my top 50 customers? Have you ever thought about how should I be marketing maybe differently to them so that they continue that loyalty to my business? Just, I'm just brainstorming. Because I'm all about referrals and I'm all about retention and that reoccurring business with existing customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very interested in it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, again, none of this is wrong. Um, I usually hear people, because that's why I said I, everybody's got to get up, but I guess not all the blood went to the brain, so everybody's really quiet. Because there's no wrong answers, because how you do business is not wrong. I'm just trying to show you that maybe there's some things you might want to sharpen up to be even better so it's less work for you. Uh, I do hear people typically say, oh, all my clients are in Outlook. It's not wrong. I've seen amazing Excel spreadsheets. They are works of art. Uh, I'm like, well, you could do the same thing in a database with a lot less work, but if you don't know what you don't know, why would you think that that'd be available? So again, there's multiple contact management systems or client management or client relationship management systems. There's you know Salesforce, there's Goldmine, there's Microsoft products, there's Act, there's I mean there are so many out there that it all depends on how you want to do business. If you want to be always online via the web there's options. If you want to have an application that runs on a laptop or your phone, there's other options. So it's not that any of them are perfect, and none of them are bad. It's just, again, you have to really define how you're doing business. Question. Yeah. Do you guys work with companies then on those CRMs to kind of try to implement them? With the Absolutely. And, and maybe I should, I don't like to give a commercial per se, but what Softech does, there's three pieces. We do business process engineering. We help define efficiencies. While we're doing that, we review current applications in-house. And uh, we also make sure what, what CRM, what, how do you follow up with customers? What application you're using? But we also talk about data integration or application integration. So that if you enter into prospect information, even in Outlook, can it move all the way through your systems to accounting for a bill as that's, a customer? That's been our struggle. We, we started using Zoho. Oh, yeah. um, we do a lot of that. Maybe a year or two ago, and we were in Outlook, and we use Ignite as our online system. Mm -hmm. But we're just trying to figure out how to integrate it. We've got different ages of employees. My father owns part of the company, and then there's me, and then we've got younger salespeople all running around. And so we really are in the process right now of struggling to be able to you know, direct information. So when we run a quote, how does somebody mm -hmm. follow up with it then yep. at that point? So. What's your first name? Chris. Chris. He brought up a point that you have to think about when you're, when you're looking at systems. There is the gender curve, bell curve, whatever. Um, I'm not saying people that are older struggle. They don't. They don't. They just, they, they, re, they understand and they process it differently. Um, there's no way I'm, my mother would ever use a contact management system. Well, because she emotionally didn't want to. She's like, no, I'm not doing it. She, That's fine. I, I can make, I can do handwritten notes. I'm like, mom, you really, because she used to be a loan originator at Wells Fargo before she retired. And I was trying to explain to her that if you put this in to a system and have alarms, you could actually sell more. Nope, don't want it. Don't need it, don't want it. <laughs> so I gave up. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I lost a client right there. My own mother turned, turned me down. <laughs> just turned me down. Just shut me down. But you have to also be uh, cognizant of making the system that can reach all 
um, age levels because you don't want a really highly complicated system because if you're not used to computers, especially older employees, they're going to go, forget that, I'm not doing it. Younger people get bored if not enough is being done for them, which it, it, it's an interesting, very interesting balance. Um, I, I find people under 30, excuse me if I offend anybody in this room, a little data lazy. It's like, oh, for crying out loud, you can send that email. It won't kill you if, you, if it's not automated. You can actually write an email. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. Um, but again, Chris brought up another good point. The information going in has to be simple, easy to manage. You don't want to have 300 fields because people are going to look at that and go, I am so not doing that. I get overwhelmed. It's not worth it to me. So you have minimal fields that all talk to each other that ultimately can give you dashboards and reports and other, other type of reporting options so that the information, the data, turns into valuable information that's digestible. And then it goes around to uh, helping make better dis uh, business decisions. Where are the companies going? So back, case in point, when I was talking to Chris, we do business process engineering. We help define or design contact management systems that how you want to do business. We also integrate apps so that the data is a single, uh, single point entry. But then we wrap it up with reporting. A lot of companies don't do the business consulting and the actual geeky stuff of integration, but we actually do both sides. Because it, it, it's much better to go that way because we understand where you're going. We can integrate your apps. We understand what your ultimate goal is versus you turning to an IT company and saying, this is my business consultant. They said, this is what we got to do. Now build this system. And then you as the customer are going, I don't know, go ahead, roll with it. Give me what you think is going to be. And then the IT people come back, they give you the system, not even close to what it is that you're trying to do in your company. That's why I just said, nope, I'm a control freak. I want it all. Bring it all in. And that's why we have such great success. Marketing and branding. Now, with this data, this is a big piece. Think about this for just a moment. Buying behavior, current status, region, where did the lead come from? Was it a referral partner? Was it the website? Was it the grocery store? You're standing in line and talking to somebody. Where it generates from, how can you foster more of that if you start seeing trends? Maybe you're really super talkative in the grocery store and you get like lots of leads. I, I don't know what you do, but, <laughs> but again, if you think about the common interests, this also helps you find or structure more efficiently your marketing and branding. So you're not just throwing money like a buckshot out to the world going, well, everybody says I should do all of this, so I must be good. Mm, okay, I always challenge, if you're going to test something, test it, watch the results, make sure you know where it's coming from, the dollars being spent, where appropriate, because why, why keep throwing money down a hole if it doesn't bring you anything back? You have to keep challenging your data. So like I was saying, target marketing. Always figure out where these people are coming from. If you are going to do marketing out there, challenge it. Ask on the phone, how did you hear of us? Or if you're doing um, paper clicks, or if you have website, you know the contact us forms? In, uh, with some of the things we've built, we actually have different pages. They all look exactly the same, but the back end hidden data you'll go to a different page if you're coming from a different source. So that information all comes into the database so that we know this came from a marketing event versus a direct mailer versus I mean, the promo codes. All of that really pays attention or gives you much more valuable information to say, should I keep doing direct mail? Or should I be make, being stronger on my website? Or pub public speaking? I talk all the time. I love talking. Uh, email marketing is another big thing. We've all been told we have to do social media. How many of you on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn? That's the three. And how profitable is it for you? I'm going to put you in the spot. How? Because you, it's easy to determine where everybody comes from. If you, have, you can analyze, if you know how to use, uh, especially like on Facebook, right. you can even determine the age of the customers. That's true. You brought up a very good point. You get the demographics. Yeah. Yep. Now, but are you getting any business directly from Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Or is it just social presence of being found? I would say mostly like social presence. Right. 
And that's what I'm hearing from almost everybody. It is really hard to directly say, I got this business customer from being on Facebook versus Twitter versus LinkedIn versus Pinterest, whatever. But everybody says, we have to be out there. Well, I don't know. Really? <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing them head now. It's been a while. It, they've been around a while. I'm not saying not to do it, but from my company structure, because we really have to sit and talk to the, the people face to face to really have them understand what we can do for them and help them make more money and be more efficient. Um, it's really hard to do in social media. Are you saying that you don't think people want to be the mayor of soft tech? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No. I know they're not that crazy. No. Um, no, but it, it's true though. It, in my business structure, what we do, I think it's great they're out there. I mean, I've got unbelievable followers and all that, and they like the blogs and they're they're learning. There's a lot of uh, uh, expert. Uh, uh, success and, and respect out there. People come and talk with us about it. But can I say I ended up earning X dollars because I'm on social media? No, I cannot. Uh, there's just too many variables and it's just too squishy and, they, and it wasn't the defi deciding factor. It was me either meeting them in person or getting emails and that whole direct correlation and that personalization. That's when I got it. I can give you data on that. So. If you want to think about this, and again, if, if the folder that I left on everybody's chair, if you want to open that up, I just wanted to show you that this was not so much a, a blatant marketing piece in what we do, but I wanted to show you to think about at high level, all of this is data. All of these areas are data in your company. And these are things you can leverage. These are things you can take advantage of. And I just, these uh, last two single pages in this folder, um, I just finished inking a deal with ClearPay and their credit card processing. And what I liked about it, admit, a couple of the goals within my, my mantra or my business mission uh, for my customers is we help reduce cost, we help increase efficiencies, and overall profit is our goal. With ClearPay, because of their wholesale rate level, because they're so large, that we can actually cut uh, credit card processing rates. It's pretty rare we can't save more money when we come in. But I also have been building an integration so that with the contact management system, you can actually see the overall amount being spent. Uh, if you're a B to C, you can see our uh, business to customer relationship. You can actually see quickly how much money these customers are spending with you, and you can actually pull up a data report and say, I want to see my top 20. Out of, let's say, 4,000 customers you have in a database, you can pull it up just financially with the top 20. Now with this integration with the credit card processing and how much money they're spending with you. To me, that's exciting, because it's data. Um, some people think I need to get a hobby, but I have one. I competitively ballroom dance, but we won't go there. So. But back to the folder, like I said, I, I showed you that all those sh uh, various pieces of paper, even the credit card processing, everything is data. It's telling you something about your customers. So I use ACT myself, but there's also many contact management systems you can use. But off of this, think of a, a wheel model, the hub spoke option, your email messages, you've got public relations, you've got inventory, <laughs> the buying behaviors, you've got project management, projects you've done with your customers, direct mail, you've got mobile marketing, which has been the SMS texting is mind blowing about the data that you can get from that. Your own website, and last but not least, you know, email marketing or, or e-blasting. We've always heard that term. And these are just the high level ones. There's more, but I couldn't fit it on the slide. Do you have questions so far? I want you to see bigger picture for your company. There's so much that can come in that can help you figure out your next step. Any thoughts on this? Or am I just kind of, you're just probably going, wow, there's just too much to think about. Have you thought about reporting? Have you thought about looking at your data a little bit different? There's a local college that we helped look at their data in a different way that uh, they were just about ready to go out of business and they're a very big, well-known co uh, college in the area and I won't say their name but they didn't realize that their new student enrollment was going to shrink because one of my consultants that were out there doing data analysis decided to go off the reservation. He was giving them the reports. They would say, I want to know X information. 
based on this question. And it's the same question they've been asking. You know, obviously, I guess their oven didn't get bigger or whatever. But they kept asking the same questions over and over. So their data kept coming back looking really solid. My consultant that was out there, and he's out there for a year and a half, just said, you know what, I'm feeling there's some anomalies. I'm just thinking it's not that copacetic here. So he ran his own queries against, uh, there were multiple sources, and realized that because they did not have new program uh, options that were popular uh, by people that were registering, that if they didn't change, their new student enrollment was going to drop by 70% in two years. They would have gone out of business. And they've been around a long time, but they didn't challenge how they asked the questions against their data. It's just something to think about. You should just always take a look at data. And if you've asked it the same way, you might want to go, how could I ask this differently? What more would I want to know from my data? Because you all are storing it. I know you are. Even if it's in a notebook. But, <laughs> but you are. So questions on anything that I've been talking about. It's a little more conceptual, esoteric, but this is going to be really impacting your, your bottom line, your, your actual, the, the green generation, the Benjamins, as we would call it. Any questions? Do you have any numbers on the cost of acquiring a new, bis a new customer versus <coughs> an old one? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there is, there's a, uh, I just read this about a year ago, that it takes only 25% of resources, time, money, et cetera, to keep an existing customer versus gaining a new one. So it's a four, four, uh, uh, ratio of four to one. If you think about how much energy, time, and you know, everything to gain that new one versus just maintaining your client base, Think about that. And if you can be really efficient on how to keep your client base a feeling of value, informed, et cetera, and they keep doing more business with you, it actually opens up doors to get more clients. And it, like I said, it just comes in through the back door. Other questions? What do you charge? How do you, how do you buy it here? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, how we charge? We usually do project bids. We usually come in for an hour. Discover, discuss, uh, define your project, talk about what it is you need, and then we come back with a project bid for you, and you get to review it. And that's where the discussion starts. Um, I have been called in for time and materials. I'm 140 an hour, time and materials. But it's really rare that we come in like that. I don't like coming in blind, because I want to make sure that what I'm doing is going to be long-term, very beneficial for you. I just, I don't like to come in and change the tire. I want to see if I have to redesign your car to be more efficient. Questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>